The Imperial Guard and Orcs. Two factions that are some of the most infamous for fielding in millions, if not billions, into the field of battle, and even with those unfathomable numbers, it's still not even a guarantee that most of them will make it out alive. So of course, in two different campaigns in which you play a lot of orcs in Imperial Guard, you have to ask yourself, is it possible to beat Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War Winter Assault for the Game Boy Advance SP Championship Edition featuring Dante from the Devil May Cry series, Deathless? Just like the last video, the rules are essentially the same. Not a single soldier of mine can die. And not just a unit. If a squad has 10 people and it drops down to 9, that's a fail state. We'll get a little bit more in depth with structures later, but for the Order campaign, which will be the first one we're doing, those won't count towards our death total because they're structures. Units we don't have control over, such as allied forces marching into the field of battle, or forces in cutscenes, do not count. They're not our soldiers. And lastly, the difficulty will be on hard. Oh wait, actually, lastly, lastly, there will be a sponsor in this video. I'd assume if you're watching this in one way or another, you're familiar with the concept of clothing. Unless you're watching all of my videos naked, in which... Please stop. Anyways, at some point or another, there will be a segment for Chimera. Spelled like this because they're cool and are actually, believe it or not, not a real-life Chimera. Those went extinct in the summer of 89. Stay tuned for that if you so desire. With that out of the way, let's begin with the Order campaign. Now for those of you who don't know, Winter Assault actually has two different campaigns. There's Order, in which you get to play as the Guard and Eldar, and then there's Disorder, where you get to play as Orcs and Chaos. For the most part, there are certain prompts in which you swap factions, so you don't really get to pick or choose who or what you play as. You could technically wait on the prompts, Say, for example, if the prompt is destroy a building, you don't have to destroy that building immediately and you can delay it, but there's not a whole lot of reason to. But the reason I'm mentioning this is just to elaborate, I can't just play through this entire campaign as Eldar or Chaos. I have to account for every faction. There is a minor exception way later on, but we'll get there when we get there. For the first mission, we had to defeat Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War Winter Assault itself. I have no clue what the fuck is happening, but it sure is happening. After 20 minutes for the first real mission, we have no retreat. No retreat. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Despite literally everything indicating that the Imperial Guard should be fucking awful in this playthrough, and hence a hellish experience, they're actually pretty good. Like, really fucking good. Now, let's go ahead and get into the first main reason why. This worker. This goddamn worker is a legendary worker unit. They can repair units much more quickly, they're more efficient, have significantly higher health, I believe they build things faster, although I'm not too sure about that one, they cost zero supply, and this is all at the trade-off that you can only have up to three. I would call this a fair trade, but I wouldn't exactly call a fucking armed robbery a trade. Everything about this is fantastic for us, but it gets better. Not only are these badass, but you also don't need a stronghold or listening post for you to build. In fact, pretty basic structures such as the Infantry Command allow you to do just that. All of this makes the Imperial Guard by far the best at establishing offensive building pushes in the entire game. Regardless, let's talk about another thing that is fantastic for the Guard. The infantry. Now say as a space marine, you have a squad of four marines you don't want to get injured. What do you do? Pretty easy, just send them into their dedicated timeout corner and never worry about them ever again. And although this is extremely effective at ensuring their survival, they're in a corner. I mean, they're not fucking artillery, they're not going to no-scope the fucking Chaos Legion from halfway across the map. The Guard, on the other hand, can deploy themselves into buildings. Not just a specific building either, quite a few of them. And they're obscenely tanky. And they can shoot out of them. And they can just fucking teleport inside of them from any building. Yes, one of the biggest trade-offs of bunkering fragile units, getting those units to the bunker, 
isn't a worry. You can have your base from the very beginning of the map teleport your guard all the way to the final objective with the press of a button. And we do just that. Using everything I just mentioned combined, we can do a pretty lethal and easy push of Infantry Command, Teleport Guardsman, Heavy Bolter, Heavy Bolter, Infantry Command. Over and over and over again. And fortunately for us, the few vehicles and turrets on the map were easily dealt with with Sentinels. Regardless, back to the actual mission, doing this strategy we can get all the way to the Psychic Gate, in which we have our very first faction swap into the Eldar. Now I'm going to be honest, the Eldar are kind of lame. There is very, very little strategy to any of their segments. Like for example, right now, their entire gimmick is that they need to aid the Imperial Guard without being detected. Okay, fair enough. This means sending in a small strike force to deal with the chaos powering the gates. Cool. In gameplay terms, this actually just means sending in the Farseer and having it tank literally fucking everything because she's goddamn immortal and has three different nuke abilities. Like look at this climactic battle against a fucking chaos sorcerer. Does this look fun? Does this just completely boggle the mind with intense micro and strategizing? Are you sitting in your chair fucking flabbergasted by the amount of skill I'm oozing from every pore of my body? Probably not. Anyways, once we power down the gate, we can just have three sentinels nuke the defilers with absolutely no resistance. I think the Turs got so excited by the last segment they alt f 4 themselves out of existence. I couldn't tell you what happened, but uh, we beat the mission. Actually, we didn't beat the mission because despite finishing the last objective, I forgot to press the move reinforcements button. Mostly because I wasn't having any units die, so I don't need reinforcements. Whoopsie doopsie. Anyways, once we clicked that big red button, we actually beat the mission and we can move forward to hold the line. Despite the start being extremely anxiety inducing, once we got our base it was time for more heavy bolter turrets. Yet again it was time for that same building loop of infantry command, turret, turret, infantry command. Until we get to about here. Right here we unlock chimeras, which can transport squads of guardsmen safely. Which, okay, cool. But the Guardsmen, being the fucking technological supergiant that they are, have a technology that no other race could hope to utilize. Holes. The Guardsmen can shoot out of the Chimera while in the vehicle. I know this is the most basic of basic technology, but I actually can't stress enough how important this is. I can actually use infantry. On the move. If only the fucking Space Marines figured out what a goddamn hole was, maybe we'd be in business. Regardless, after we got a bunch of chimeras full of guardsmen, we get to the really, really annoying part of this mission. This one lane is set up with a bunch of turrets and artillery tanks firing at you. And that's why we actually just unlock the chimera. Unlike the last campaign in which you absolutely don't want to use transport, it is a very good idea to use here and get through it with minimal casualties. The problem there is minimal casualties. We can't have that. So, we have to destroy the artillery and turrets. This is not very easy, as looted Lehman Rust tanks have massive HP, we can't hope to set up turrets around it, and repairing while damaging it isn't a possibility since it can just knock away our workers and probably kill them. So, what we had to do was send in a Chimera, get off like a hundred health of damage, go back, repair, Rinse and repeat until the area is clear. And although this took an immense amount of time to do, it's really just that simple. Extremely tedious, monotonous, and boring, but simple. In fact, about like 70% of this mission was dedicated to just this one lane. But eventually, enough was clear that we can ride our chimeras in and deal with the actual forces on top. Once we clear that out, there's another Eldar transition where... By the gods, artillery is blasting the guard and that's not exceptionally good. In fact, it's really, really not good. So I have to go through a pseudo stealth section where you have to destroy a few guarded generators to get the orc's attention away from the artillery so he can run in and kill them. It's a cool section all things considered, but the generators aren't that well guarded. Which is why you're going through the effort of killing them off rather than fighting through the main forces. 
So really, unless you're throwing in your squishy ranged units into the thick of battle, you don't really have a whole lot to worry about. I mean, the actual artillery is annoying as fuck. That can easily massacre one of your infantry, but the Farseer is just way too tanky, and although it takes a lot of time, it will eventually kill off all the artillery single-handedly. Afterwards, we regain control of the Imperial Guard, and oh boy, Basilisks. Remember the Whirlwind Artillery Tank? That vehicle I oh, oh so loved in the first video. Now imagine that, but multiply its range by like a thousand and actually have it hit things. If you think that sounds a little powerful, that's because it kind of is. Although it's not the end-all be-all of vehicles. If enemies get too close, their usefulness can very quickly dwindle. There's also another weakness we'll get into in just a second. But another thing that I wanted to mention is that all the guards vehicles are really strong. And not in the I'm going to make four land raiders and one shot everything strong. They're just incredibly balanced and all have really fun and powerful niches. That's a discussion for later though. Once we unlock the basilisks we pull off yet another familiar strategy. Stronghold drops. Because of that one lane taking 20 years of our life, we have essentially infinite resources to divert into winning. And although nowhere near as close to as awful as the whirlwind, Basilisks don't do as much damage if they're firing completely blind. Hence, we're just going to keep dropping strongholds over and over and over again to get temporary vision to deal with the defenses better. It's not cost effective by any stretch of the imagination, but when you have essentially infinite resources, why not? Once the defenses are mostly gone, we can just get a solid concave with the rest of our vehicles, get to the smurfs, and this guy just casually kills a bloodthirster with a cool hammer move. I'd say this is debatable at best, but they're the ultramarines. I'd say this is about par for the course. After this, we can move on to Between a Stone and an Axe. This mission actually starts off with the Eldar, and holy shit, we can actually build things. However, that excitement very quickly waned, as I realized this is essentially a dumb tutorial mission. The entire point of a section is to go, hey, Eldar can teleport buildings. Did you know that Eldar can teleport buildings? Use the teleport move to not die instantly. Which is cool and all, but why? This is the type of mission premise I would expect to see in a one-off gimmick mission early on in a longer campaign a la StarCraft. And there is a bit of tension because, oh no, the teleport move has a cooldown and the orcs are attacking us. But, uh, no, the attack waves are so lame that you only need a few turrets to fend them off. This is the entire Eldar segment. And if you want, this can literally be the last time you ever move an Eldar unit, as, minor spoiler, Mission 4 and 5 you get to choose which faction you want to play as, meaning you can literally play this entire campaign as the Eldar, deathless, without building a single unit on the highest difficulty with almost no micro. I wish this was hyperbole, but no. They remove the strategy in real-time strategy. In fact, they're getting dangerously fucking close to removing the real-time as well. What does this leave you with? Nothing. The Eldar are nothing. Sure glad I got to play as them. Once we got our Imperial Guard though, we now have to protect the Eldar base until it can teleport into ours. I've literally fucking had Iron 4 League of Legends allies go AFK and be more useful in this. Regardless though, we can do just that. But here's the thing, this mission is now a defense mission against a massive orc wah. And holy shit, I don't mean that lightly. They really send out everything. Good thing we have the Eldar in the corner, with worker units and the ability to make units doing fucking nothing. Because fuck it, if we don't have four goddamn races in a campaign, it's not a good campaign or something. Sure fucking glad they're here. Anyways, uh, that aside, however, at first it's handleable with the infantry. Just a bunch of heavy bolter turrets and the newly unlocked Hellhound can help out with that. And then there's orcs that can jump over walls, which isn't too handy for us, and force me to construct interior turrets as well as perimeter turrets, and then looted Lehman Rust tanks. This is where the defense started to fall. 
because we had no possible way of dealing with those. Meaning our only option was to have them kill off more and more and more structures freely. Which is not very ideal with our very finite resources. After three to four Lehman Russes amassed, freely raining terror upon our weakened defense, it gets a whole lot worse. They send in a Squigoth. And this is where I had to really start tryharding. Our only option was to send in our vehicles into the corner where they can't get hit and slowly build up more and more heavy bolter turrets to hopefully weather the storm. And really, there were very minimal maneuvers I could pull off here. Every second was closer and closer to our inevitable downfall. And then, once the orcs started finally pouring through our base and all hope seemed lost... It is the Bane Blade! With a staggering 20,000 HP, I had the Bane Blade tank the oncoming force while I desperately tried to establish our defensive perimeter again. Eventually, I finally got a bunch of missile turrets to take down the Squigoth, which ensured the Bane Blade a slightly longer survival. Then I started target firing the looted Lehman Russes, and when it only had a measly 4% HP remaining, we finally managed to fend off the wall and beat the mission. Afterwards, this final journey, and this is where we get free reign to choose between the Imperial Guard or Eldar. But unlike the Disorder version of this campaign, you're actually pretty heavily incentivized to go one or the other. I think it should be pretty obvious what my choice was. Fatal Scar Error. Anyways, this mission was fucking awful. You have to get this land raider to this location. That's your only duty. The problem is the land raider has the pathing of a fucking potato. For this, I'm gonna pull up MS Paint. If you go up this way, not only can you set up a defensive perimeter to deal with the 20 quintillion orc and chaos forces trying to fuck us to death, but we will also get free Imperial Guard allies to come down and defend it as well. The Land Raider goes, hmm, that's a good idea. Fuck that, and just has a prescribed route of going through the jaws of hell itself through the fucking bases of both the chaos and orcs, and I'm not even kidding, even outside the confines of a fucking deathless run, it's incredibly easy for them to just die instantly. They're nearly as worthless as the Eldar. Luckily though, Commander Stern has an ability to tell the Land Raider to fuck off and go in a different direction. There's an issue with that though. Eventually, after enough time, the Land Raider will go, Yeah, this is cool and all, but I want to commit suicide. Which means you have to have Commander Stern nearby at all times. Meet the Horror Squads. These abominations do massive damage against vehicles and can very easily nuke one in just a few seconds. After you find this objective, which is near mandatory since you need it to get your fucking vehicles, they will always teleport on top of Commander Stern. Now if these things always teleport on top of Stern, which has to be nearby the Land Raider so it doesn't commit suicide, which has to be surrounded with defense vehicles to make sure that it doesn't get overran, guess what the horror squads do? They kill a fucking vehicle. And if your solution to all this would be, okay, why not just not get this objective and build heavy bolter turrets? We literally cannot. In fact, you actually regress a lot in what you can build. Which is really obscure for an RTS campaign, but I guess we're here. There's no heavy bolter turrets, there's no strongholds, there's no infantry command, there's no machine command to make vehicles. You got minefields. Woo. So I actually needed to find out an ideal start. This position right here is great, and we need to constantly restart to try and get into it. Because if we surround the Land Raider with big enough vehicles, it might not be able to move. Meaning we can just send Stern to the corner and not have to worry about the Horror Squads. There is still the potential for the Horror Squads to kill Stern though, so we have to keep a bunch of bunkered guardsmen to ensure he doesn't die. Which now means we can utilize artillery. And also, since we can utilize our artillery, we can now use our engine seers to repair our important vehicles and deploy landmines. And also, since this is a very entrenched position, units have to funnel to get to us, meaning our defenses are better than ever. Is this an obvious solution? M maybe. But just like Ogres, it has a lot of layers you need to account for before you get into an ideal scenario. 
Actually, let me go ahead and scratch ideal scenario. This is pretty much the only way to win with this challenge. It's essentially a puzzle. But after this, we essentially have infinite time on our hands to do whatever. Do you know what you can do with infinite time? It is the Bane Blade! Yeah, now it's essentially GG. If you knew the steps before getting into this, this would actually be a very easy mission. It's just hard to establish that game plan. But regardless, the Bane Blade is just way too tanky though for the horrors to ever do anything to it, so we can just keep calling the Land Raider over and over again through the optimal path and beat the mission without casualties. Now we can move on to the last mission of the campaign. And in true Dawn of War fashion, it's the easiest by far. At first, I was pretty stressed out because of the mission layout. I was figuring we are going to have a mission where you have to constantly hold the line from all sides. But excluding this one area right here that occasionally sends out looted tanks, all they do is send out basic infantry. Something you can easily defend with like, three heavy bolter turrets. So this was complete overkill. Regardless, afterwards we set up the power generators to power up the Titan. Necrons. Now the Necrons are fucking scary. They're bulky, do a ton of damage, and overall presented a very huge and real threat towards killing us. Problem. We have Titan weaponry. The Titan two shots monoliths. This isn't really much of a threat. Now I'm gonna be honest, I usually don't spoil the video this heavily. But I believe the only race that doesn't use the Titan to just completely ass blast the Necrons out of existence are the Orcs. You know, because... Orcs. So when I get to the Disorder campaign, I'm actually going to be finishing the campaign as the Orcs, so it's not a rinse and repeat of this mission. Speaking of which, actually, let's go ahead and move on to the Disorder campaign. Actually, wait a minute, it's sponsor time. What, did you... did you expect, like, a coherent transition I put in the actual script that I read? Fuck no. You expect way too much out of me. Chimera. Assuming you're a normal person who is well-adjusted to the concept of society and hence clothes, you'll probably like these. Look, let me be blunt with you here real quick. I am the most stereotypical guy when it comes to clothes. The, I'm going to buy 15 plain t-shirts with no design and wear them until the day I die type of person. So when I went from plain blue t-shirt number 84 to one of these great looking, great feeling shirts, it felt like upgrading from a fucking toy helicopter to an Apache. I don't even think that metaphor fits, but it felt really good, okay? They have shirts, they have sweatshirts, they have hoodies. They ship fast with a satisfaction guarantee and great customer service. Like, no joke, they're actually one of the best people I've ever worked with, even outside the confines of a sponsor. So if all this interests you, feel free to check out their website and use code DAVY to save 10% off. Okay? Okay. Let's go ahead and commence crumpin'. Disorder starts off with orcs and gather the clans. Now here's something that's very, very not fun about orcs. If you can't help but tell, a lot of our buildings have Gretchen on them. That's a living being. Those cannot die in this playthrough. Which means, none of these buildings can die in this playthrough. So that essentially means orcs can't really utilize building spam unless it's an insured one-hit kill. Okay, sure, that's fine, we can work with this. We'll just have a heavier reliance on units and pushing. Problem? In case you haven't noticed by the giant skulls, crude architecture, the word WA in the corner, and the fact that we're controlling orcs, we're playing orcs. Those don't have a tendency to have high survival rates. So we have to play through the entire campaign with a very, very heavy reliance on Gorguts. Gorguts is a tanky motherfucker. I want to say just as, if not tankier than the Farseer. The amount of punishment he can withstand is mental. So whenever possible, we want to move out with him at the front. Regardless, just like the mission name implies, it's time to gather the clans. For this, we have to go to each of the clans and take down their banner, showing them that Gorguts is the biggest and the meanest. Unlike this loser idiot in the cinematic who got crumped. This is actually pretty simple, as Gorguts can actually outrange this banner right here and eventually get the quick mechs under new management. 
which is pretty good as the quick mechs have mechs that can be quick. War trucks. Those can be upgraded into artillery, and that made getting most of the other clans fairly simple. Except for this one down here which had tank busters which hurt a fuck ton, and I had to bum rush their banner ASAP before one of my vehicles inevitably died. Once we got them, we can go to the last clan, but by far the most powerful. These boys got squigoths, and if you're concerned about potentially having to take down two squigoths, that's a valid concern. Until you find out that there's just a mad doc here that has 2000 HP that you can threaten to crump if he doesn't help you, who can just conveniently go up to them and tame them. Gorguts now has two squigoths. GG. Next mission, you start with chaos. This mission actually starts off as one of the more weird openers, mostly because you load in and uh-oh the boys are wanting to crump you, which is not very good. So we had to restart this a few times to eventually get all of our forces out alive, but once we did that though, the rest of the mission is actually stupidly easy. You have to kill off Gorguts, although kill off is in air quotes, and you have to ensure that your temples survive. The cool thing though, is that you don't need all of the temples to survive. So I just mobilized everything I had by this temple right here, and with the forces that the orcs throw at you, they have absolutely no chance of ever defeating this. Then you have to defeat Gorguts, which is impossible until you kill off the shield he just casually found. Fucking orcs. You do this by destroying a plasma generator at the bottom right, which is very easy to do since you can just send out a chaos sorcerer down there, teleport by the generator, kill it off without retaliation, then you have to crush the Wa which is just as easy as the normal squads they usually send out. And then you transition into Gorguts. This section is pretty much a no-build section. You get a whole bunch of boys the more Imperial Guards you kill, although in a lot of cases that's actually detriment as they can spawn in during the middle of a fight and get themselves killed, but there are two orcs that you really want. Firstly is the war track at the very beginning of this segment, and a looted tank near the middle. If you just have your looted tank target fire the basilisks, the free chaos waves crashing into the Imperial Guards will inevitably make their way into the base. Which is just GG. Excusing the potential for boys to commit suicide, this is very, very easy. At least it's not Eldar, I guess. Third mission, Blood for the Blood God. The opening segment you play as an orc force and have to kill off Commander Stern. Problem, he has pretty much every unit you had under his belt. Except for the fucking Bane Blade, thank god. So I had to spend many minutes meticulously planning my every approach because Sentinels would just completely slaughter my mechs, I was never going to send in my base infantry, and the knobs get melted by other units. The best approach oftentimes ended up being sending in Gorguts or the knobs as a distraction while I get to nuke the Sentinels with War Tracks or kill a Khans. Or kill a cans, I actually don't know which one it is. I think they say both. Then I push forward until I encounter another sentinel, rinse and repeat until we get to General Stern, who is luckily very easy as there's a position right here we can abuse his AI, and his guardsmen will ironically never reinforce him. Then Grimgore just completely fucking demolishes him, and we can start moving on to the chaos segment. This mission is very simple, Protect the center from basic infantry squads, aka build like four fucking heavy bolter turrets, and get five guardman squads to the blood pit. The problem is, for one reason or another, the guard are not very fond of you just taking their forces to be sacrificed. So they will shoot the squads you take over before you can sacrifice them. Okay, makes sense. Problem, artillery. What this meant was fucking horseshit. So here's the strategy. Get a bunch of predators, kill off every unit except for the guardsmen squads, which is actually very difficult because they have a lot of anti-vehicle and artillery, then put them on ceasefire, have them tank guardsmen las guns for 18 years, abduct a squad, and pray to whatever god may listen to your voice that they don't fucking shoot your abduction. Was this difficult? Uh, not really. But it's extremely fucking annoying. 
But once you do this, the Eldar come in and they summon an avatar. And all you have to do is just bust out a Bloodthirster and one-shot it. Very climactic battle. Anyways, the next mission is the same as the Orders. But this time you take control of the Chaos and the Orcs. But unlike the last version, you're very heavily incentivized to utilize both. That's because you have to prevent the Eldar and the Imperial Guard from getting to the end. Problem, you need to be able to play the mission. There's a very weird bug where occasionally you can swap to Orcs and have zero starting resources. Which funnily enough was my first attempt. You usually start off with 5,000, and I need you to stick with my math here because I admittedly don't have a math degree. 5,000 is a little bit higher than zero. So I very, very easily lost that mission. Which was cool, because I didn't lose the mission. Yeah, there's actually a very high chance that this completely breaks upon swapping to the orcs. Which, although fitting, very annoying. So I had to spend like 15 minutes restarting over and over and over again to actually start. Once we do start the mission though, we need to introduce tactical inting. If you don't know, inting is an online term that you may know if you're a masochist. In this example, it's intentionally killing off your own units. But Davy, I can hear you typing. You can't do that. That's illegal. Good point. But here's the thing. Orcs and Chaos are enemies. If you play as Orcs, the Chaos is your enemy. If you play as Chaos, the Orcs are your enemies. So if you can swap between Orcs and Chaos, you can abuse this. Say for example you send in a Chaos unit. Then, before it starts to take damage, you swap into the Orcs. That means that Chaos unit is now an enemy. What this means is we can do the shitty little dance where every time a unit on one faction is about to take damage, we swap into the other just before it dies, which means it's an enemy death, meaning it's not our death. It's... it's a weird dance, and admittedly the timing is actually a lot more precise when I'm giving it credit, and is it a bit on a cheesy side? Yeah... But with how this mission is laid out, you're heavily incentivized to use both factions. Orcs kill off the Eldar, Chaos kill off the Land Raider. I don't really see a whole lot of scenarios in which the Orcs could actually defeat the Land Raider without losing a unit. And since we're going to be doing the last mission as the Orcs, this is our main strategy. Once we take care of the Eldar though, and the Horror Squad just completely decimate the fucking Land Raider, we now have infinite time on our hands meaning we can just get any army we want for the orcs. Of course, this ended up being a lot of looted tanks and a squigoth. Also, the fucking chaos leader keeps fucking coming back. You're not going to see this a whole lot because obviously this is very heavily condensed, but I think the amount of times I've heard blood for the blood god, even if that blood is mine, I'm ready to fight and kill again, is easily in the higher double digits. At the very least, this does enough damage that the Imperial Guard never actually tax our base, which is nice, I suppose. Anyways, for the final objective, other than this avatar which is a complete nuisance with just how often vehicles tend to overlap on each other and stop themselves from moving, this was very easy. Also, basilisks were pretty annoying and oftentimes made repairing impossible since they would always call off a Gretchen. But other than that, it was very easy to just completely decimate with our tanks, and we can get to the last mission of this video, Trophies. Why is there a fucking helicopter outside of my room at 3am? This isn't even like, a joke or a skit, it's 317, there's just a fucking helicopter out there. Is this what I get for uploading Pokedex war crimes? Alright, whatever, Trophies, if I die, I die. Trophies starts with a pretty minuscule orc force in the corner of the map. We also regress quite a bit back in technology, as we can no longer produce looted tanks or squig-offs. Which is, uh... fun. I guess I always wanted 10 war trucks. Anyways, the first objective is simple. Kill off these two guardsmen outposts. We can crump them with ease and get to the second objective, which is a bit harder. But also bait. Like I mentioned earlier, there's a point in this mission where the Necrons come out of the sky, and uh-oh, we gotta crump them. But orcs, being the best race in 40k, don't need a stupid fucking titan to do so. So we're given an objective. Destroy the titan guns out of spite. Which is pretty difficult with them having 10,000 HP. 
What you want to actually do is kill off the Titan Guns before you do a subjective. Which is very easy to do and it entirely gets rid of one huge component of this entire mission. Once you do that, you can also reach Kroll and begin the Necron fight. I actually made a really massive fuck up early on and put down two buildings right here that immediately died because a Necron monolith just spawns right on top of them. So this is where most people would reload a save before they put down those two buildings and get to the same spot again. But I am an honorable orc. I'm going to solve this problem with the tried and true method that all orcs employ in difficult scenarios. More fucking Daka. Shit. I, I didn't mean to do that. Even more fucking Daka. With this unique layout and army composition, we can immediately start blasting the monolith the second it makes landfall. And with Gorguts tanking the hits, he can very easily destroy this monolith without losing any units or buildings. The other one is a bit more difficult though. We had to get a pretty convincing concave on it in order to defeat it. It's a bitch to set up, but once you do it, your war trucks and 10 billion tank busters can nuke it down with ease. This monolith was more of the same. By far the hardest out of all of them with it having a very enclosed space, but this one actually doesn't move, meaning you can theoretically spend an infinite amount of time setting it up. At this point it was GG, and setting up yet another concave I killed off the final Necron and... I killed off the final Necron and... Huh. It appears the mission broke. Look, there's a lot of bugs that can happen with triggers or random mechanics when you save and load. If you're repairing a vehicle when you load, there's a chance that you can literally never repair that vehicle again. The same thing applies to buildings. If you start constructing and save and load, there's a chance you can actually never finish constructing that building. Something a bit more sinister that can happen in this campaign is when that happens to mission objectives. I complained about it in the last mission where I was stuck in limbo despite reaching a fail state, but at this point I reached limbo despite reaching the win condition. So... Let me reenact how the rest of the mission would have played out. Yeah, that's literally it. Kroll has basically nothing defending his quote, base, and he's a pathetically easy fight. I put fight in air quotes as well because he's supposed to be easy. So I guess my orcs are stuck in purgatory because I guess Kroll just messed with the warp and ensured that I can never kill the Necrons that I already killed. So to wrap this up, can you beat Warhammer Dawn of War Winter Assault Deathless? Yeah. Just make sure to watch out for Kroll's gold experience requiem at the end. As always, thank you to my patrons who pay me to help me make my dumb videos that other people watch for free. If you have disposable income and feel like supporting the channel and my comic antics, feel free to click the link below, or the one that's hopefully on screen. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed the video. Feel free to click arbitrary buttons to make numbers go up, if you so desire. And as always, 